In studio with Sheriff Nate Harmon. Nate, good morning to you. Good morning. Great to have you here, sir. Good to be here. So I, I was supposed to ask you this question, oh, uh, I think the last time that you were on, and uh, it has to do with squatters, okay? <laughs> so I received a, a text from somebody who said that they had a friend who had a property in Martinsburg. Yeah. They would go to Florida in the winter, and their house would be empty for the winter, and then they'd come back in the early summer, late spring. And, and one time when they did that, there was actually people who were living in the house. Illegally, they weren't renting it or leasing it. They just assumed residency in the house, mm -hmm. and, and and it was it was hell evicting them. The law basically was not on their side to get them out. Okay, I don't know that this was necessarily in Berkeley County or not, but can you tell me what the law is in regards to that? Well, if it, all it takes is to, uh, for someone to either accept mail there or be there for approximately two weeks or longer, and they've established residency technically. And uh, but In that, a house they don't own? Well, that, that's a very unique situation. I think that's more of a property manager uh, issue than, uh, you know, uh, having certain layers in place to check your, your your real estate but that's that's odd um i would i would find that the courts do have draw an issue with the fact that you know they're they're throwing a family out on the street so they, they've got a moral and ethical issue in their hands on that but if someone resides at least in the state of west virginia if someone resides uh in a home for two weeks or longer and in, in that period they've accepted mail there then uh they've have established residency there and now you got to go through the eviction process wouldn't breaking and entering supersede somebody living in my home who i didn't invite in sure it would if they uh or destruction of property for that matter i mean if they're breaking and entering they have to have an intent to commit a crime which obviously that crime would be trespassing mm -hmm. uh, and or destruction of property especially if they're residing there i've not ran into that situation but i would be quite upset if that was so my property but but, but, but but sheriff if you carry this to the extreme if someone goes on a three-week vacation mm -hmm. they could safely come back after a, a vacation find out their house has been uh, occupied and they have no recourses except going to court is that correct no absolutely no in, in the state of west virginia i think the reason why we haven't ran into that is we got common sense judges and uh, magistrates and on up that that would see that situation for what it is and the fact that we have common sense citizens the, the they care for their property they have property managers they have house setters and when uh, law enforcement's involved, we see it as exactly as Rob put it earlier. It's a breaking and entering. It's, there's a crime being committed there. So we address it that way. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal about this just very recently, in the last few days. And it's more pernicious than this because you've got snowbirds that are going back to their homes in Arizona and in Florida. And the squatters actually have a fake lease mm -hmm. that they can show to the investigating officers who they... They don't know if it's fake or not. So then that extends it into another court proceeding in order to get someone evicted out of your house. There's a whole industry, apparently, that's mm. built around this. Mm. Well, that would be fraudulent schemes in this state. Well, yeah, and, and oh, I presume that it's ultimately adjudicated in favor of, of the property owner. But, but in the meantime, you know, you're out of your house. Yeah. And someone's in there damaging it. Well, uh, the good thing about felony cases, fraudulent schemes is just obtaining uh, services, goods, or, or the like uh, under false pretenses. And... Um, that would be an applicable charge. It is a felony. It's a, a, it is an arrest, immediate arrest. And, uh, of course, it's a, if it's a family, CPS would be involved. Epic would be involved. All the resources that Berkeley County has to where we can eliminate the moral and ethical issue of throwing a family out on the street like that. And I think some courts, and this ain't California or New York, uh, I, I think we've got common sense uh, judges that, that, that would uh, decide in the, in the positive on that. I would hope so, because yeah. you know, he, this guy here travels a lot, Nate. <laughs> and he's got a pretty nice spread. <laughs> so and you know we're on the air, right? And, and the address <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was an Airbnb. Or, yeah. So I might, as a vacation home, I may take up residence inside the Gilstrap Estate. Yeah, <laughs> while he's away and claim it as my own. But sheriff, this kind of invokes upon the uh, the issue of homeless. For a lot of us, uh, it's, it's kind of a transparent issue. For you, it 
is not a transparent issue. Uh, how big a problem do we have in Berkeley County with homeless? Just like the pastor said at the uh, rescue mission, um, which I uh, have full intentions on working with to help address the homeless problem, it is a problem. It is a huge problem in this area. Um, you know, obviously I can take a very pointed, direct approach. Uh, I can uh, not only enforce the panhandling uh, ordinance that uh, was put in place, whereas if a person uh, impedes or obstructs traffic because they're giving the money to the panhandler, then they can be found liable uh, f uh, for that ordinance, uh, violating that ordinance. And, you know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to, um, discipline or, or, or punish somebody for wanting ha wanting to help somebody. And I think that's the uh, issue a lot of our officers have, not to mention that the, they, a lot of the panhandlers uh, flirt with the you know, city limits and the county limits, especially Foxcroft Avenue. And then you see families sitting there. Um, it's trespassing when they're on other people's property and they've pitched a tent or, or now it becomes a colony. And it just needs to be addressed uh, head on, whether it's uh, additions. I know Rescue Mission has made great strides with the programs that they have. And it's just, you know, we don't need to facilitate the reasons that got them there, whether it's drug or other substance abuse. And I want to be able to point them in the right direction to help address the problem because that problem is what got them there. I think that's how we need to approach that, and that's how I'm going to approach the pastor with it. They, there are various encampments. Are they, uh, are they been well handled or kind of more or less ignored? How do we deal with the encampments that for the homeless? Uh, in all honesty, um, and and uh, with you know full transparency, I've ignored it and okay. I've not addressed it enough and. The pastor that I've heard, uh, you guys either had him on earlier in the year or last year, um, and uh, I think he does a phenomenal job. He wants to address it. He's a common sense, uh, boots on the ground type of person. I think us teaming up would be a, a very good start. Um, I have not had any or developed any initiative specifically to address it. Uh, what can you do about it, though, in all practicality, if, if – uh if there's not a place to go, I mean, we don't have enough shelters and such, so what do you do? I mean, I, I move from this corner. Okay, we'll just go down to the next corner. Well, I think what you need to do is, again, uh, team up with the rescue mission, first off, and then approach these uh, problem areas first and see what the issue is that, that keeps them there. And if there's not, uh, identify where the gaps are in this system is it a facility that we need here to uh, expand uh, we have the resources just not big enough or staffed enough then that becomes more potentially a county commission issue or a legislative issue i think but until that effort full-on effort is completed by us uh, and the uh, others that that uh, have a hand in this like folks that provide uh, um, resources for the homeless until we can come together collectively and and have an effort in place, we won't actually be able to identify the specific gaps that are there resource-wise in Berkeley County. That's what we need to do, and I think uh, teaming up with the pastor will help identify those gaps, and then we take that those issues to uh, the county and or the state. Yeah, my question was prompted in large part, Rob, by Parkersburg, which is just – surface this issue the last few days mm -hmm. and they're trying to uh, uh, establish ordinances where they can or cannot uh, mm -hmm. camp and from all reports from the outside looking in uh, they jumped into a, a problem much larger than what they thought they would be it's become very very controversial uh, did you see 60 minutes on sunday Yes, I did. Yeah, yes, they I dealt did. with yeah, the, same, the same large thing, yeah. encampments in major cities. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I'm coming back to the point, uh, Sheriff, that your you made the your statement full transparency. You've not been as active as what you should have been. I'm not sure, but what that's not the right approach. Well, as um, long as nobody's been hurt. Well, uh, if you listen to Pastor Garino, there's a lot of human trafficking going on there, in those camps. There, okay. There's there's a lot of sexual. Um, criminal acts that's committed. I mean, m me and my association with 
the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center and, and, and Katie Spriggs and, and what they go through. I've gotten phone calls in terms of the homeless um, and a girl having to work, earn her right to be in an encampment, specific encampment, and, and, and accepted in an encampment. You know, they have to sleep with people. They have to, uh, you know, open, be open to uh, certain sexual acts and whatnot. And she was enslaved by this other person, and this other, both of which were homeless. And uh, we dealt with that situation uh, in a, as a team effort and got her away from that that uh, that situation. So, and that happens more often than what I I know. Well, and there's a quality of life issue too. Nobody wants to be walking across the parking lot with an armful of groceries, right? And then being confronted with a stranger asking for money. I mean, there's a very fine line between asking for money and demanding money. And, you know, it's just who, it's quality of life for, for folks who are you know, just going through their daily activities to have to make decisions mm -hmm. about, you mm -hmm. know, is this a friendly person or an unfriendly person? You know, currently, we address it when it's a problem, mm -hmm. uh, um, like the situation I just described earlier. Um, and, and that, I don't feel is the correct approach. I think that we need to have an initiative that addresses the homeless because you don't want full board colonies and popping up everywhere and people crapping in streets and just all the gamut of issues that you see across the states of those that didn't do enough preventable measures before it got to be that big of an issue. I didn't see the 60 Minutes episode. Um, is, where were these people before? You know, obviously there's been this political upheaval that of, of the last four or five years, but we have the homeless encampments. It used to be that homeless encampments were broken up and they, they go someplace else. Where did they go? And where are they coming from now? Apparently they went to Los Angeles. Well, a lot of them did, but even, but Los Angeles is just recently permissive of this. Well, think about this too. I mean, we do have the VA center in our backyard, and a lot of people come from out of state to get services at that VA center. At some point in the VA center, because I go there, um, you know, the resources there have done what they could do for that individual. And instead of the, that individual going back to PA or wherever they're from, they stay here and either they run out of resources or whatever catapults them into not investing in either occupation or the like, uh, they become homeless. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of homeless vets and that's, you know, it's that in part contributes to the problem. Sheriff Nate Harmon, our guest here on the program, I want to ask you about uh, progression of school safety in mm -hmm. Berkeley County and your efforts with SROs, the school system, right now is pointing towards developing their own private security force in the schools. I know that's not what you want. When I, when I talk to some of the other folks in the legislature, it doesn't seem to be what they want, but it does seem to be what the Berkeley County School Board and the superintendent want, Nate. Um, and I, I heard about House Bill 2549. Um, I wish they would have gotten some sheriff's opinions on that, uh, but it is a literally a mirror image of the guardian program that i presented not only the legislation but the now superintendent and and other admin uh here in berkeley county long ago i'm talking 2017 2018 and it mimics it was a it's very similar to the marshall program in, in texas so everything that i've read was senate or house bill 2549 is an exactly exact duplicate however you have to have law enforcement involvement. There's really no way to get around it because once you start taking away the SRO, the, the, the spirit of why there's an SRO, the SRO is supposed to be interactive with the students. I know uh, there's uh, a uh, EPIC is flirting around with a uh, prevention officer, but there's literally uh, no policies or, or guidelines in place that have been solidified because the pilot started last year and even if there were i'd say that that has to encompass this local law enforcement or the sheriff in that jurisdiction because what happens is you there has to be a certain level of required training and vetting and you, one there's got to be checks and balances with that if there's a problem at the school we're going to get called and I would very much appreciate that person who is armed in that school to be on the same page as we are tactically and, uh, um, you know, 
understanding what the protocols are going to be when we show up. Sure. I may be wrong. I may be confused. But what I understand is what was proposed, what has been discussed with the school board is is the same thing as the SRO, not the Guardian program or not the uh, 2529. Uh, it's uh, doing the same thing as SROs, but it'd be funded by the school board that would be duplicative, uh, but in just different schools than what you're proposing. But it would not be an employee of the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department. No, no, exactly right. It, but they'd be looking for a different gene pool to get these individuals. And their complaint uh, mostly with this was that they didn't want a scenario whereby there was an emergency in Berkeley County falsely generated that would draw the SRO out of the school, thereby mm -hmm. leaving the school vulnerable now mm -hmm. without the SRO. And it turned out that this was just the formula put in place to get into the school. I'm 100% for that. I mean, I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Pat Murphy even um, announced that he was going to provide funding for three uh, SROs either earlier this year or before the end of last school year. Um, I, I guess we're still talking about that. Um, I hope that that's still on the table, and I hope that this money that was announced for SROs uh, would still be invested in SROs. And I just – um, this isn't anything negative against school administration, but when you don't have the, all those stakeholders at the table talking, then you only it's a one-sided conversation and directed program. There has to be law enforcement involvement uh, with, in situations like this because it is. At the end, yes, this is what I want to have, have happen. Now, you don't want contractors sitting out in the front lawn of the school. Um, I believe Senator Carr was promoting a bill similar to that, um, and these were retired vets with uh that that could work as contractors i don't think that that's a, a good idea at all um and, and i'm glad that this school has and i've talked to mr stevens about uh the epic program so i think we're i think we're at a point where we're genuinely on the same page in terms of what the end goal is it's just how we get there and then how is that going to be managed and i'd love to be a part of it and i, I think if i'm not or whoever replaces me or, or law enforcement in general isn't a part of that, then it, it, we're going to do ourselves a severe disadvantage. But the Guardian program that's been proposed, or 2529, that would be independent of you, or would it be, would the teachers that carry arm, would they be trained by you before they go into the schools? I propose that they be trained by me, yeah. and uh, they would go through certain uh, specific specialized training that I would do. And and, and therein lies my issue with a, a one-sided, one uh entity over overseeing the program there's a difference between standing in front of a paper target on a flat range and just playing 50 rounds at a paper target versus stress induced uh situational training when you put a hood over someone's face and then you pop that hood up and then suddenly they're presented with a situation how are you going to address it within that five seconds because the public expects those individuals entrusted with that kind of safety to make the right decision all the time and if we're not introducing those folks to stress-induced training, which I think from a law enforcement agency, we've had probably more training than anybody in regards to, you know, those types of situations and how we can mimic those type of situations well and efficiently. If you're not involved in that kind of training, then it's, then it's a, if we're just checking the box, then we're doing ourselves a big disservice. And I just... I hope and I pray that the, their intentions are to bring me to the table at some point and discuss this because I've discussed it with Ron. I've expressed that if they go the epic route, I would love to be a part of that. Um, I don't know where we're at. Is there resistance to that? No. Like I said, my conversations with Mr. Stevens is, uh, you know, I think we're genuinely wanting the same thing and uh, and that's overall school safety and i just don't feel you, in that bill 2549 you'll see where again it just gives it gives districts the permission to do this not not all the districts and not all the districts are going to do it um and i've been advocating for berkeley county to do it and be that be that example that we can run a very efficient uh safe program as long as we are partnering up with law enforcement and the school system like we always should and we do during these events and we've had 54 critical instances last year uh, we solved them well because we communicated with each other we just had a recent one with uh, i want to say spring mills if i'm correct and uh, 
it's it's a uh, it's a situation that was handled well. So if, before it was, uh, you know, we were all on our own, on our own little island. And, and I like to think that I played a small part in bringing that together where we have a direct communication system. We're working a lot better together and pulling all of our resources. That's us, uh, city, PD, that's the task force, that's the school, that's the SROs. So potentially we could have three or four different groups working together. One would be the guardian program within the school. Mm -hmm. Second would be the SROs provided by mm -hmm. the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. or And the third would be the SROs provided by the school board. No, I, I, my vision, and, and I hope Mr. Stevens is listening to this, my vision is that the SROs would be the first tier management or let's say supervisors of EPIC. Um, or this uh, House Bill 2549, whatever happens first. I don't think you need a trio uh, of things. I think we need to keep it clean. I think we, and, and I think we need to be, we need to sit down and discuss uh, standard operating procedures and guidelines. And that needs to be clear because something is going to happen that will give us additional protection, whether that is EPIC, whether that is the, the Bill 2549, something will happen. But what we don't want to happen is do nothing and continue to talk about it and have contractors in our front yard. It's not, I do not want that. And so whatever needs to happen needs to happen quickly. And we need to do it collectively here in Berkeley County before legislative session. Staying with schools, but shifting gears a little bit. Um, one of the big issues that was highlighted when Jackie Long and, and Pat Murphy were here is attendance. We have real problems with, people, with kids attending school. Are there truancy laws still? There are truancy laws, um, and the the issue that you run into is is the it, it's a case by case. I mean, there's there's federal protections, or I would say protections with folks with uh, special needs and whatnot. And there's a certain uh, structure of uh, discipline that's allowed, and uh, some that's not allowed. And you know, you got to see if it's a manifestation of the disorder. And if it is, it kind of falls into a different category that the school has to uh, abide by. And at the same time, uh, I'd like to say that our SROs uh, actually help with that. You know, is it an issue at the house? Because we have some awesome SROs. They actually go to the house. And they actually have found that there's been issues inside the domestic issues inside the house. Uh, sometimes it's the parent that literally has to, to fight through the trenches to get their kid to go to school. I mean, I lost count of how many times um, parents were calling 911 because they couldn't get their kids to school. And I've emphasized that that is not a law enforcement duty. That is a uh, the truancy department for the schools need to really pick up on that. There is one? Well, yes. Okay. Yeah, there is truancy uh, enforcers there at the schools, yes. And they do, they, they have their hands full. I mean, they get uh, all kinds of uh, excuses, but there's a lot of things that govern that. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think they're, they're wanting to do the right thing. If they see an interruption in the child's learning processes because of mom or dad or, or guardians, then, uh, you know, they, they try to, they have empathy for the child. And, and uh, it's a parental issue versus a child issue. So I would imagine there's some, I wouldn't say bending of the rules, but I would say that they would have have empathy for situations like that. Nate, to close up this uh, hour here, um, in regards to the sheriffs and school safety, is there a unified approach by the sheriffs of the counties of West Virginia in regards to SRO programs in the schools, or is it right now a hodgepodge of individual counties? sheriffs lobbying on behalf of what they want i can tell you that the sheriff's association specifically will be very interested in not only 2549 but what epic is doing and i i can assure you i'm not speaking for the president or the sheriff's association but conversations that we have had i can assure you that there's going to be a loud voice in charleston that says that we need to be involved and need to be a part of this so if there's any polishing or amendments that need to be done to that bill uh, that would be where uh, law enforcement, or let's just say the sheriff, has oversight or needs to oversee the training and vetting process. Has the association had um, input on that, Bill? No, not that I'm aware of. A couple of comments uh, from board members just to finish this off. 
Uh, Jackie Long said, Rob, that isn't totally correct. No one wants to place the SROs. And Damon writes that the board hasn't made a decision, just gathering information to find out what would work best overall and getting multiple points of view. That's in regards to what will be the method of security in the schools. Nate, thank you for visiting with us. Uh, welcome. I always appreciate coming here. Thanks, Nate.